Welcome to Citizens Forum. It's April the 16th, thank yes. God. Yeah. And uh, the first segment of Citizens Forum this week is going to be um, talking to two members of uh, Victoria School District 61 mm -hmm. school trustees, the school board. This is a tremendously important issue and I think you're going to be a little bit surprised um, about you know some of the things that are going on school board wise. Our two guests are Deborah Knorr and Edith Loring Kuhanga and we're going to begin with them just uh, introducing themselves. Uh, Edith. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jack, for having us on the show. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the Coast Salish territory that we live, work, and, uh, and um, study on. Um, and I've been here for the last 28 years, so I'm a visitor to this area. And uh, I'm originally from Hazelton, and I'm a Gitsan from the Gitsan Nation. And I'm a member of the Lakabu clan, which is the wolf clan. Uh, and uh, a member of the House of Gwinnanu, so that's the house that I belong to. Um, I'm a mother. I have two sons and raised four uh, nieces and nephews, and I'm a grandmother of four children. Um, I moved here in 1984 to complete my Bachelor of Education degree and uh, was immediately hired by the West Saanich people out on in the peninsula. And so I worked with them for eight years and started my own training and consulting company and ran my own national training and consulting company for um, 19 years. And um, then I went in and uh, started my master's and finished my master's in education last year. Um, and so, so I've done a lot of work in education and I was first elected to the Saanich Board of Education in 2008 to 2011 and then uh, was elected in the Greater Victoria School District in 2011. Mm -hmm. And Deborah? Thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to uh, just start by saying that I'm really pleased to be here today <coughs> and I'm very excited to be a trustee. And uh, the reason is that um, I have a very heartfelt uh, uh, f focus to advocate for our students. Uh, they don't have a voice, and I feel that that is probably central to my work, is to advocate on behalf of the students and to reflect to the public and, and to parents and to whomever else who is interested about the, the, the real experience that our students have in the school district. Um, I also have a, a long history in, in education. I did an undergraduate degree at the University of Guelph and then a master's degree at the University of Ottawa. I was teaching at that point and so I had many years of classroom experience. I uh, moved out to Victoria and I was a teacher in the Greater Victoria School District at the elementary school level and slowly shifted to special education and so I became very very familiar with um, the broad variety of, of, of um, learning challenges that some of our students have and the ability through a personalized and adapted learning that we can bring to them to bring success to their experience in the schools. I, I taught also in Boston, Massachusetts, just in a small city, Lawrence, outside of Boston in, a, in an inner city school and I saw, I saw that, that culture of the inner city school where uh, there was less success and um, a lack of funding. I took 10 years off from teaching and then I came back to Victoria and I came into the Victoria school system as a substitute teacher and I had the opportunity to uh, teach at the elementary, middle and I even did some high school teaching because of my uh, qualifications around special education. I was able to do that. And um, at that time, that was in 2003, 2004, I started and I was struck by the similarity between Victoria in some instances, in some rooms, in some school settings, and what I had seen in an inner city school in, outside of Boston. And so I said to my colleagues, what, what is going on here? Why are some of our students not getting the instructional support that they need? 
and they said, well, this is the result of the change in economic ideology and the funding formula for public education that came about at the time that the Liberal government was elected in 2001. And in particular, they brought two bills in, Bill 27 and 28, and with that, there was a shifting in formula, formulas so that we have approximately, approximately in 2013 dollars, about 200, sorry, 300 million dollars a year that's been taken out of public education funding. So if things were like they were back in 2001, 2002. We would now have an extra $300 million. A year, provincially. And that would be approximately $10 million a year for Victoria each year over that 10 year period. So that's a tremendous, that would be a tremendous boost. We would have the teachers we need, the EAs we need, we'd have the QP support, we would um, have the, the textbooks that some teachers say they don't even have class sets of textbooks in some instances. So you mean that money would solve the problem? It would bring us back to a place that was very viable. And so that's, that was my advocacy and my desire to run as a trustee came from that realization and seeing it firsthand in our classrooms. And that's our classrooms across the province. I represent and have worked in Victoria, but I know that this is the reality across our province. Um, we've got a, just a list of questions that we're going to go through or topics, but um, Edith, maybe that would be underfunding, I guess, so mm -hmm. maybe you want to join in on that issue. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, I mean, as Deborah has said, you know, there's the funda funding issues are really, you know, have really had an impact on all all school districts and I think that you know we talk all a lot about struct a structural deficit within uh, school boards and we continue to see more and more funding being downloaded or more and more uh, programs mm -hmm. and services being downloaded to the school boards like uh, that weren't really included like say for instance teachers pensions and MSP premiums and EI premiums that are going up so we continue to see things that are continue to impact our, our kids and um, you know and so you know I look at we're having a budget meeting that's coming up on Wednesday and looking at some of the figures I mean of you know a little over a million dollars a million and a half dollars that are that is going to be cut from materials and supplies and you know one of the questions I have about that is what does that mean what materials and supplies are being cut in order to try to balance the budget right so Victoria School District for the upcoming year mm -hmm. you're cutting a million and a half dollars out of materials and supplies. Yes, right. and the structural deficit. I just want to throw in here. Okay, I just want to throw in the thing. The term teacher burnout was mentioned in here. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just talk about that or? Yeah, and you know the the I, I was talking to Deborah and Deborah was talking about sort of the the teacher burnout. Maybe she could mention that. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, okay, uh, the sorry. the most recent uh, figures around that is that within five years of new teachers coming into the profession, 50% of them <coughs> are leaving the profession. And that, that is in large part due to teacher burnout. We have young teachers who come in with passion and they have an idealized commitment to, to teach children and to be committed to their positive experience in the school system. And they walk into a class and they're overwhelmed. They do not have the aid time, the educational assistant time to support some of the, the students. There's, in our, in our elementary schools, we have counselors only, often only one day a week. So there's behavioral and emotional needs that aren't being met and the teachers are the frontline workers. And here they are trying to teach curriculum and they're trying to deal with the underfunding that results in the lack of services to these students both emotionally and academically. Okay. So there's okay. burnout, burnout and disappointment. They're disillusioned. They come away feeling incompetent. I thought that I could do this. Why am I being unsuccessful and ineffective? And it's very, very, it's tragic because these teachers have so much to give. Also, the wage has not kept up 
with other provinces. And so teachers are thinking, you know, I have, I have four and six years of university. I can go into other sectors and possibly do better for myself, considering the working conditions can be overwhelming. I taught uh, a little bit, just subbing in the public school system many, many years ago, and it was a very, very, very tough job. Um, Edith, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought, mm -hmm. I thought, um, but if you want to go back to what you were you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. Well, on Wednesday night we have our budget meeting. It's a special budget meeting that we're having, and in the Greater Victoria School District, we're uh, right now we're anticipating an 8.3 million dollar structural deficit. Um, so it's actually eight million two hundred and eighty-four dollars, or two hundred and eighty-four thousand. Um, that's a structural deficit. And so we're looking at having about $16,000 in the bank. And um, so when you start taking a look at what, what are some of the things that have actually been cut in order to even get to that point. So we have like, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, 1.7 in department budget savings, which is basically a lot of materials and supplies. 1.7 million. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's a, um, a decreased teacher average salary of a half a million dollars, um, a benefit premium cost saving of 800000 So you start looking at some of those things and start wondering, like, t starting to carve all of those pieces off in order to try to get a balanced budget. And for me, I really believe that public education should be fully funded and we shouldn't have mm. to be continuously increasing our class sizes, continuously um, you know, providing less service, support services for our students that are having difficulties in the classroom, but we're seeing more and more of that. And uh, so I, I actually ran as a trustee um, because I really believe that public education should be 100% fully funded by the government. Um, and we shouldn't have to go through fees and we shouldn't have to go through, um, you know, raising money and applying for money in other ways like international education to offset public education in BC. Well, I think um, just, I mean, just, in, just, I'll just show my opinion. I, I think just as you know, the, there, there has been, I think, we can edit, the, just as there has been, I think, an attempt to basically stress out and damage and destroy our public health care system, mm -hmm. so there seems to be an attempt to stress out and damage and destroy public education. I think there is, I think there's absolutely a parallel there. Mm -hmm. We have um, ads on television where nurses are saying, Am I supposed to go to the person who's just come out of surgery or should I address the patient who is in intensive care or should I, you know, change the, the tubing on somebody down five rooms from there? I think teachers have exactly the same experience. They hit the ground running in the morning. They have far more than they can manage in a day, but they are doing the best job possible. Our teachers are tremendous have a tremendous energy and a tremendous commitment. Our EAs do, our QP workers do, but I would like to say that when we undertake the responsibility to care for our children emotionally, socially, and educationally, we cannot be driven by the bottom line. Mm -hmm. It is just absolutely um, immoral to have this corporate agenda that squeezes dollars out of the system that are essential. And uh, we cannot continue to underfund public education. We have a moral imperative to take care of our, our children. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an equity issue too, because what happens when there's underfunding, and we've had 10 chronic years of, under, chronic years of underfunding, we never have all the money we want, but this has been 10 years of chronic underfunding. Then we have a situation where those schools in the um, higher, uh, socioeconomic socio demographic, we have parents that are stronger advocates. They do more fundraising in their packs and pull in twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for the books in the library, for the uh, field trips, and they have parents who can drive cars and take them on all these field trips. But conversely, in the areas where we have a lower socioeconomic demographic, we have parents who often have not been 
particularly comfortable in public schools and therefore it is a challenge to come in and advocate for their children and it, there's no doubt that there is a growing disparity. The squeaky confident wheel gets whatever dollars are being carefully um, given out and so every child deserves equity in their learning experience and so we need to have the full funding to allow that to happen because right now the system works in favor of those that have the privilege of stability in, the, in their, their economic situation. You know I grew up in a I guess what you call lower middle class neighborhood mm -hmm. but there never seemed to be a shortage of money in the schools. I mean we had great schools I think even though I wasn't a big fan of being in school mm -hmm the facilities and the teachers and the money was there and that was that was I think one of the things that made Canada a great country and it's being destroyed quite deliberately by the people who run the country I mean it's it's not happening by accident that we have record bank profits and no money for our schools mm -hmm. uh, um, Edith so there's a list of questions here I'm not sure you just mm -hmm. pick the one you yes. want and I was just gonna say and, and I think that the the big thing is is sort of recognizing the investment that we put in our children is what we get back in the end and as long as we're not investing in our children in the fullest sense possible through education mm. then we see the consequences of that and I think that Mary Ellen LaFond, Terfel LaFond has done an incredible job with um, taking a look at uh, sort of some of the issues that our children face in the criminal justice system and uh, being in care and lack of education and the correlation between all of that. So I think that the more and more that we continue to, um, to not fund public education in the way that it should be and for, for our kids to get the best out of it, we're going to see the end results down the road. Let's, yeah. let's talk a little bit about what's going on here in school district number 61 because some of it seems to be quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the issues you'd like to talk about but please just mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. anyone. Well first of all I want to I want to say that you know there are lots of good things going on in our schools and and I think that Deborah has certainly talked about some of those with the teachers and our educational assistants and our QP workers and that there are a lot of good things I mean you know I, I'm really amazed at how much the teachers are able to do and the staff are able to do with the little that they have and so when I have went throughout the schools and I see you know a lot of the uh, like the anti-bullying programs that are going on the fundraising and really sort of um, having kids become more socially conscious about their fellow Canadians and uh, their fellow citizens in terms of fundraising. I mean, Reynolds School has done a remarkable job in raising money for cops for cancer. I mean, over $100,000 in that school. Last night at our board meeting, we heard from another one of our schools um, that has did an incredible job with a middle school in run in fundraising for United Way. I mean, so there's so there are a lot of really good things that are happening with Aboriginal education within our school district. We've had an increase of Aboriginal students uh, for grad rates over the last couple of years. We've started to see a an increase in our grad rates. Um, yesterday we. Uh, just uh, signed off uh, the committee at least signed off on a on a renewed uh, enhancement agreement taking a look at what are some of the four goals moving forward for um, Aboriginal education within Greater Victoria School District so I think there's a number of great things that are happening in the school district and I think that Deborah wanted to say <coughs> other things but there are some really good <coughs> things but there are a lot of challenges as well and I think that's what we continue to fight with is trying to balance off all of those good things that are happening and trying to continue to fight for the challenges that we're facing. So maybe you can tell us not only what's going on in the schools but what's going on with the school board. Oh, sure. J I'd like to make just one or two <coughs> comments about our, our schools. We have, a, just a, a we have approximately 19,000 students and about 1,400 teachers in the Greater Victoria School District and uh, we have just tremendous skill and talent in, a, in our teaching pool. So we have 
uh, wonderful fine arts programs and we have wonderful sports programs and uh, we have uh, great opportunities that are growing around humanitarian projects where students at elementary, middle and high school levels are becoming involved in um, global awareness of um, social issues and their social studies or their science or their math curriculum is being interwoven into these, these projects where they are um, studying about a country or about a village and they're um, fundraising and many of the high schools uh, to have and are taking trips to these countries after they have done all sorts of research and preparation. So it's making learning more real, more relevant, mm -hmm. and often very, um, uh, we call it a personalized in that Johnny can do his project on um, the architecture of schools in Africa and compare it to the architecture of schools in Canada. And Sally can do her project on nutritional needs of children in Africa and nutritional needs of children in Canada. So um, there's th that type of relevance in the curriculum, I think, is, is growing a little more. It's very dynamic. It's very demanding on teachers because there's, you know, the textbooks aren't there. It's more, of a, a, a more organic and um, use of technology to come to do these, this type of research. Um, I would say also that uh, there's a great deal of uh, focus on sustainability, e elementary, middle and high school level. Our, our ch children in our schools are learning about the central significance of sustainability and ecology in our schools much more and interweaving all curriculum in that, in that way. So, so those are, there's a couple of things that I think mm -hmm. Uh, making learning more real, more relevant, and the interweaving of, of curriculum. We've only got about five or maybe oh, five minutes left. Okay. Oh. There's, uh, I told you it goes fast. Oh, okay. So, um, are there any... I, I want to talk about... Yeah. So, okay. You yeah. tell me and I want to talk um, about emotion or two. I, yeah, I guess the big thing, f um, you know, one of, one of our biggest challenges uh, has been open an open board and having some t transparency and being accountable to our electro right I mean the school board should be accountable to yes the people I who really live who elected us yeah, right sounds like a good idea yeah <laughs> and um, so I really believe wholeheartedly in that and one way to do that is have it through question and answer period and so I put a motion forward in February and uh, which was asking for you know question and answer period one in the beginning of the meeting and one at the end of the meeting, giving people an opportunity to ask us questions and give us a little bit of feedback on our agenda at the beginning of the meeting. And hopefully we'll be able to address and um, incorporate some of their ideas throughout our discussion and our debate. And then at the end of the meeting to be able to ask more questions of us. And um, of course that got tabled and first of all it was defeated and then it got tabled and then it got moved over to an ad hoc committee that is now looking at board proceedings. Okay, so just, uh, just to repeat, the, the motion was that people, <laughs> the citizens questions. who live here, yeah. could ask our school board some questions. That's yes. Okay, yes. and that got, that's in limbo land. And this so was over 19, a year ago. 19 out of 20 districts that were researched by the associate superintendent have question and answers p periods. Ours was the only one that doesn't. Mm -hmm. I remember that yeah. flaring up mm -hmm. in the media, but now it's disappeared, yeah. but we still don't have it's the It's at solution. a committee level. It's at a yeah. committee level. and That's what they always do. Yes. They, they, so, I mean, the question is, why do so many of our elected representatives, our uh, school boards, city councils, provincial governments, and federal governments, they all seem to become the same. They don't want to talk to us. They don't want to hear from us. And... Uh, personally, I'm happy that I think we have a, at least two and, and more people mm -hmm. on our school board who are trying to just bring in a more democratic process, and I mm -hmm. think that's important. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. The transparency is very important. We value the input of our citizens. That's really, that's where we get the greatest insight. I would like to just um, mention also that um, I put forward a motion to bring all the data about our class organizations into um, 
uh, a chart that we could then put on the district website so that the public would know the sizes of our classes, the number of students with special education designations, um, the number of split classes we have. And we have a growing number of kindergarten grade one splits and that's a very, very, very challenging split that teachers have come to the board and expressed their concerns and said, please don't do this. This is kindergarten is play, grade one is focused on reading and shifting into um, a, a more settled approach Structure. to learning. And uh, yet they're growing in our district. So I brought, I wanted to ESL students and gifted students. to let people see the numbers of what's going yeah. on in the classes. And okay. um, so it was, vote, it was voted down. So our school board voted down a motion to let the public see what's going on in our classes. Yeah, and we don't even hear about it because I won't talk about the media, but why doesn't the media report on this? Why isn't this front page news? This is important stuff. Mm. Well, I think, I think when the public knows this, I have confidence in the public that by knowing this, there is a greater probability of advocacy. Mm -hmm. I need to hear from parents. I want parents to write an email to the MLA and say, our funding is not sufficient. Here are three things that I saw in the report on class organization. I'm troubled by this. We need to have more people informed so they can be more effective in their advocacy. We need we need people that uh, we need people attending our board meetings, right? So they can really understand what's going on at our board table. But one of the big things is is being being able to be open and honest and transparent, and you can't do that behind closed doors. And uh, so you know a lot of our motions that we've been bringing forward is be is uh, being accountable to our public. And uh, like I've said, I've said this at, at a several board meetings, I don't feel that I should just be accountable every three years when I'm seeking re-election. I want to be accountable every single week, every day that I'm sitting at the board table. And I feel that we all have to be accountable. We need to be able to have the public be able to ask us questions and be able to respond. And if we can't do that, then why are we elected to be representing them? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very wa much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. I mean, the issues being discussed here are the most important are our uh, public school system and democracy itself, even down to the level of the school board. Is it accountable? Is it giving us what we want? What, what goes wrong? And uh, thanks very much for watching, and we'll just uh, hope for the best. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs>